Hi everyone. Um, I think welcome to our monthly series of uh, machine learning in astronomy and space science. So for those who didn't join our previous talks, the purpose of this series is to um, investigate the applications of machine learning techniques in astronomy and space related science. So we will invite speakers from different, you know, different fields of astronomy and space science, and they will talk about how they apply the uh, machine learning in their research. So today our uh, speaker, invited speaker is Dr. Jianxiu Li. So Jianxiu is currently a staff astronomer in uh, Keck Observatory. So I think his works has been mostly related to the time domain uh, astronomy, and therefore is no doubt an expert in this field. So, um, for example, he's part of this uh, important project called Antares to develop a um, time domain broker that can uh, digest the transient alerts delivered by, uh, for example, the ZTF and in the future, the LSSD of Rubin Observatory. So the title of his talk today is the machine learning applications in time domain astronomy from uh, the wiki trend. I think I got the full title here, the from the Wiki Transient Facility to the Rubin Observatory's Legacy Survey of Space and Time. Okay, Jianxiu, I will let you take over. All right, thank you so much for introduction, Yenzhen. So yeah, as Yenzhen said, I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, mostly about tandem astronomy. So when I got the invitation for this talk, I was thinking machine learning is a very good title, but actually uh, during this work, it's more, more than machine learning. And then I would say, I just slightly changed my title. And then it's like the take and wonders uh, can make astronomer no longer need to stay up all night. So uh, let me start with the good old days when how uh, the astronomer um, did astronomy. So you can see here, uh, it's about uh, a few decades ago uh, when astronomers doing astronomy is not like leisure like today, we need to climb into the telescope and sit in the prime focus for the whole night and then you know, stay there in a very cold, cool environment and then just you know crunch into this very tiny space, just take very long exposure of distant objects. Um, at that time, uh, we also need to uh, make identifications of um, like uh, new objects actually by eye. So after this long night's observation, what you get is like photo plates display here. So this is actually the true, the real images, uh, the photo plates that uh, Clyde Tambo um, used to discover a uh, planet Pluto. So uh, this were taken a different night on different nights. So the left hand side is the earlier date, on the right hand side is a later date. If you look closely, there are two arrows pointing you to uh, Pluto, and that's how he made the discovery. So it was actually very active with blinking between these two images. Um, so you might wonder how you know easy you can identify them. So there's a lot of time there's a machine called a blink comparator. So what it does is that on the left hand side you can see it's a machine there, and then you can see that two slots, so you can put two different photo plates there. And then when you look into that machine, you know, you can um switch back and forth between these two plates and then blink them. So that's how uh, Kai Tambao was able to discover uh, this moving object and then identify it as uh, uh, as Pluto. Um, nowadays, we are getting better and better. For example, we have a modern, you know, electric camera and those uh, equipped, you know, and those are really uh, large format camera equipped on uh, the largest telescope on the world. For example, here I show one, uh, one of the uh, set of instruments called prime focus spectrum, uh, called a hyperspring cam camera on the prime focus of the super telescope at Mauna Kea, and it's really huge. So it's about like uh, with about three tons. That's about like three small cars, and they hang there high in the prime focus, in about the size of a human being. Um, and then with this uh, this uh, beast, we're able to uh image a very uh large portion of the sky. So in the lower right hand side, you can see um, you can image uh, almost the entire Andromeda galaxy, which is about like three times the size of the full moon. So that's really amazing how you can see, uh, you know, capture a large field of view and then with these very nice sensitive detectors. And then uh, we don't need to rely on this uh, blink converter anymore. So we can uh, with uh, very smart ideas how to do uh, image comparison. So right now the state of art 
a way to do that is actually image separation. So what you can um, see here on the upper row is that how you can uh, separate images um, from each other. Um, so on, in the upper row, you can see those are very dense data field. And then we'll separate them. Uh, you can see, uh, we call them the difference image, which are the separate images. You can see the sources. On the lower row, I show you like close look what I look like. So usually to do this kind of work, we have a Sam's image, which is kind of like the image you take every night. And then we have a reference image, which is like, a, you know, you get all uh, of the base images and then try to combine them together to have this reference image. Usually you uh, subtract your size image uh, um, from your reference image and then you get a difference. And that's how you can identify if there's anything, you know, popping up or moving around. And if you look at closer to the, ref uh, the difference image on the lower right hand side, you can see not only there's a source in the middle, but then you can see um, some of um, not so properly subtract residuals. Um, so it's also uh, our job to try to identify them and then, you know, try to see which one is a real source, which one is like artifact or like the fake source. We call them bogus. And then the way we do that is not with the uh, in, uh, the uh, blink comparator, but right now we can do it like from the leisure of home. So, uh, so here is one example how we can do that. So there was a group, uh, they tried to build like a home theater. So you can see all these images in a very large space. So easier to identify them. Um, and then you might, you know, have like a army of students or postdocs to do them for you. But here is the question. So are those really sufficient to deal with all the flood of data from all these uh, large tentacle surface nowadays? And the answer is no. So that's why we have this talk and that's why we want to know how to use machine learning to do this. So just to give you some brief like introduction of how the current uh, state of art uh, tandem surveys look like. So these are all the large uh, format uh, CCDs uh, from different surfaces like pen stars, uh, from the PDF, APDF, and then Swiki transitive facility. And then in the not so uh, far away future, we're going to have a looping observatory. And, and in particular, uh, so right now you can see on the right hand side it's just you the field view of three key, which is about uh, forty seven square degree, is composed of sixteen um individual um, um, um detectors, and you can see the Andromeda galaxy occupies only one tiny detector block, and slooping is going to be a uh, larger, uh, even larger uh coverage. Uh, right now the three key is delivering about one million alerts per night. So uh, that is actually beyond the capability of just using, you know, eye inspection to tell which one is true and which one is, you know, like focused. Um, you know, they decide that if you can have the time to fit in and then to decide which one you want to invest time. Um, and then in a couple of years, when Rubin concert line will be about 10 million dollars per night. So those are really beyond the current uh, capability of just use like, you know, uh, eyeballing to do a uh, target selection. And then what is make it more interesting is that among those 10 uh, million uh, alerts, there are so many possibilities. So this is, uh, we call it the probability tree um, to see uh, what kind of different kinds of source they can, you know, vary either in time or in position and then to be, um, to trigger all those kind of alert. So they could be uh, stars or state objects like uh, variable stars, they can be also eruptive or um, 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 explosion um, stars like supernova, like Yen is an expert. Uh, and then there could be moving objects like asteroids, which Edward is also expert in. And there could be like agents, which are, you know, um, active galaxy nucleus that change uh, uh, metric probabilities from 10 to 10. Um, and then among all of these, there are actually uh, kind of like sources that vary very rapidly. So for example, um, supernova usually will be, you know, once it's uh, erupted or exploded, you will have say uh, days to months to follow them up. But there are also very surely uh, objects like uh, gamma ray, uh, alpha uh, and then other kind of object that their decay time is less than a day. That means, 
you probably will have one or two days uh, to uh to follow them up and then try to understand their nature. You know, it's a very um should live event. So you need to grab that chance. Uh on top of that, we don't have really uh many of the follow-up um capabilities. So we can imagine that Rubin is a eight meter telescope. So if you can catch that with uh like you know image, if you want to take a spectra to understand the nature, you've got to spend more time than you know just one night. So we don't, and then with a large telescope, like eight to 10 meter class telescope, we don't have that many resources. So how to like allocate our resource and then try to um seek out the priority. That's also another um another uh, big uh problem we are facing right now. And so, you know, with all these very nice um surveys and with this large amount of alerts, people have come out with a way to easily digest it. In the good old days, astronomers just sit in the telescope room and then observe all night and then try to digest image by one, two people alone. It's not going to be possible nowadays. So right now we divide each of the tests into different pieces. Um, so, and then we call them the uh, 10 domain ecosystem. So you can see from the upper screen on the upper left hand side, other surface like Ruby and CTF, and then there are also like multi messengers uh, experiments like the uh, rotational wave uh, experiments and then the ice cube for the uh, neutrinos. And then they are sitting out surface, but they probably will not do my, uh, much more than, you know, just keeping us alert. And among those millions of alerts, if we don't do, if we do nothing, they're just, you know, or just, you know, we'll just miss all those very nice chances to find some of the hidden um, gems inside them. So uh, people have been thinking about how to do that. They come up with an idea called brokers or the data sharing service. So it's very similar to like you go to a stock exchange and then you ask a broker to tell you which are the most valuable, you know, stocks or securities. So you can invest in them. It's a very similar idea to use brokers. And then once you find those uh, interesting targets, you move on to the next level, which is uh, in, you form your science teams and then you try to collaborate with the other. And then in this case, we are using different um, science platforms to share information with each other. So I can collaboratively decide which targets want to go after. And then once you decide that, you can uh, have a pool of resource uh, of telescope time you can pull together and then trigger the observations. So that's when it goes from the science teams to the observatories in the middle bottom part here. And then there are several follow-up observatories uh, which are dedicated for this kind of work. And then once you get observatories, uh, got the data, then you also need to find a way to um, share the data uh, with the uh, public curators. So that's where the data archives comes in. So let's first just uh, focus on the surface. So how we can use machine learning type of surface. Um, so give, just to give you some idea, so when Rubin comes online, it's going to deliver about 20 terabytes of data per night. What it does is it try to take a, a sequence of 30 second images uh, covering the entire sky, uh, entire southern sky, like every few days. Um, so what it would do is to do the image separation um, technique I showed you before. And then once they did that, um, they will see if there's like a new objects. And if they did they, they see that they have detection, they will send out alerts. Right now the requirement is that after 60 seconds or one minute after they close the shutter, they were able to uh give that um alert uh send out. Um uh, because that's a huge amount of data. So they are not going to, you know, just give it to anybody on the world. So what they're going to do is this like uh uh, dedicated uh, community brokers, which can have the internet bandwidth to uh accept to receive all those alerts, and then they are going to deliver them to the brokers, and all those um, alerts are free. Um, there are other like uh maybe more reduced uh, products like prom products or data release, which are kind of like preparatory to the uh, Rubin uh consortium. But the alerts they are all public. So is there a way that the machine learning can help in the in those alerts 
um, the answer is yes. So this is one example uh, from the Swift key transient facility. So right now, because Ruby is not online yet, so people are using Swift key as like a, um, a test bed for all this infrastructure. And when Swift key send out their alerts, they actually rely on a machine learning process, especially the deep learning process, to use a convolutional neural network and try to digest the images. So they are trained on the images. So you can see here, there's a science image, there's a reference range and difference image, as I showed before. Those are the products from the uh, interpretation technique and train on those images. Um, so they have labeled uh, different kind of objects. So they have like uh, a bunch of uh, students and postdocs uh, looking to hundreds of thousands of uh, the alerts and then they decide they, they label some of them to be like uh, explosion of stars like supernova and some of them like variable stars. And some of them they are like, we call them focus. So they are not real objects, they are more like artifacts. For example, if your image subtraction pipelines start working properly, you have a bad subtraction. Or if you have like a bright star and then it's like kind of saturated, then you will see some residuals. Uh, but they still show like a detection. So using the um, uh, the uh, conventional neural network, they were able to um, separate uh, the bogus from the uh, real object and then assign them kind of like a score. So this is how we can easily use them to digest. Well, you know, some of them, they might not be real objects, so we don't need to spend time to uh, digest them. So that's one way machine learning can help. Um, and then, so that's from the survey side. In the most heavily, um, working uh workhorse um uh, for all this fitting uh process is actually happening during the broker side and that's where we can really rely a lot uh, on the machine learning. Um so what does proof do? So actually uh we have this about a million object from the um Ruby on Surgery. So the 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 brokers will uh, gather all these alerts. Uh, from the Ruby Observatory, they don't really have like a very good uh, uh, information on those um, detections. Um, Besides that, uh, they just give you maybe the timing of detection, the brightness of detection, or maybe they will have like a history of, of uh, on this location, say about maybe uh, two weeks to a month of uh, information. But beyond that, there's not, not much more. So what the brokers can do is to provide contextual information. So first they can, you know, get all those alerts and then they can uh, start to collect on the same location and they can, you know, aggregate them. So it can form like a baseline of the photometry for more than a month. So uh, right now, uh, if you look at Swiki, it's already running for more than three years. So all the brokers, they can provide you like a, of more than three years uh, amount of time on a given location. And then beyond that, the broker can do much more so they can look into different um, catalogs. So uh, most of these surveys they are conducting in the optical band and they usually have one, two, or even like three filters. But then the broker, they can look into different um, catalogs. For example, the Sloan Galaxy catalog, um, or the two mass uh, catalog, which provides you uh, infrared information, or the Galaxy satellite catalog, which gives you other information in the UV. Um, so, and then gathering all this information, uh, and then beyond that, they can also look into like a Galaxy catalog to see if this alert associated to Galaxy. So, if that's the case, it's more likely to be like a um exploding star like supernova, or if it's very close to the center of Galaxy then it's likely to be a uh, Asian. And then um, based on those, um, then uh, we can also do some rank of these objects. So we can do like extra features from the light curve and then um, based on the light curve shapes and also based on the uh, nearby ga uh, galaxies that are associated with them, we might also be able to get some red shifts. So from those, uh, you can use them to say, this is likely to be a supernova or this is likely to be a variable star, and then to fit them. Another good thing about broker is that they provide you a visualization of uh, all these alerts. So on the right-hand side is one of the work we did with Antares is to show you all this aggregate information, like, you know, 
you can see the like curve. Uh, this one is uh, taken from three keys. So we've uh, the G band uh, marked in green and then the R band marked in the red. And then we also have the timing of each of the alerts. And then also look into like other catalogs to show them. Um, so, and then, so actually broker is more like uh, this, the place you go if you want to, uh, you want to uh, explore more about all these alerts. And then, you know, uh, some very simple basic things you can do with broker, not even involving the machine learning, is that you can ask, well, if the broker can tell you which uh, are more likely to be supernova, and then you can do like, uh, so like a follow-up campaign of all these supernovas, and then you stand to do the cosmology, especially with the type one supernova. Uh, you can also look into like uh, tidal attraction events or uh, agents which are close to the center of the galaxy. And then you stand to study the uh, the galaxy, especially the supermassive black holes hosted by the galaxy. Uh, this can be easy done just to look into uh, alerts associated with catalog of the center of galaxies. Um, when, um, when we have the alerts, we can also look into a moving object. So because we have the timing of the alerts and then the position of alerts. So using those timing and position information, we will be able to uh, tie them to either a regional solar system object, or if they are uh, not down solar system object, we can also you stand to derive the actual parameters of new um, objects. Um, so this is what kind of service we are providing with Antares. So we have, uh, we call them streams. So they are uh, still like uh, um, subsets of the um, of all these uh, raw streams, raw alerts on Swiki. And then we kind of characterize them into different kind of um, categories. So you can, if you're interested in the uh, extragalactic sources like supernova, you can go to the extragalactic stream. If you are interested in agents, there's a nuclear transient stream. And if you are uh, interested in the solar system object, there's also a solar system uh, stream you can uh, subtract to. And the good thing about that is uh, with broker, we also can provide you ways to notify you. So people used to rely on emails uh, to get notification, but right now you can actually use um, Slack, so we can actually send you a Slack notifications, uh, so you can um, see if there's any uh, object hitting your uh, say the your uh, target of interest uh, in real time. And this is some of the work we've been doing uh, with the entires. So we throw in some of our um uh, follow resource. Like we have like two minute telescope, we have four minute telescope, and also German telescope time. And then with all this uh, simple uh, like selection, we we're able to get some very nice object from supernova to nova, and then uh, to different kind of uh, objects there. Okay, so beyond those very simple things, you can also use machine learning to do more fancy things. For example, when you want to do a classification, um, there are several ways to do that. So here I show you one of the um, um the uh project that uh delivered by uh one of our collaborators. So what we did here is we can compare um the light curves, um uh, from original classes. So for this uh um machine learning process per se, we're actually constructing um different kind of like templates from different kinds of sources from supernova to kilonova and then to tetrahedral events. And then some of them, we even have like a physical model of them. And then for this particular uh, machine, learning, we call it a rapid. So what it does is that you can take a uh, data um, as it, uh, you can take the like of as it evolves. So from day one, you know, you can compare to a given model and say it's more likely to be a certain um, class. And then as the Likert evolves, you will compare to different model, and then you can refine the classifications as they go on. And then you can see here is how it used to, uh, to um, classify an object from CDF as the data rules in. Um, there are also other ways uh, to do uh, this kind of exercise. And one thing that we are really interested about is to see if there are objects that we have no idea what it is. 
Um, so one simple way to do that is we look into already known um type of um stars and then try to uh under the understand their properties statistically. So one way we can do that is to look into the um the change of their brightness in different uh, filters or even in the colors, and then to put them into a uh, different. So you can see that here, like supernova, when they occupy a spatial space, uh, when you look into the time, it uh, gets dimmer and then, and how much it gets dimmer and then which field it is, it's very different from the agents. So in principle, if you have like object and then you can just look into this statistically, um populations and then once you see something which is not fitting into either of all these already known um objects then you are hitting you're probably hitting a jackpot that is a very rare event and then you can also throw some time into that um so and then with all this we also have like a way to report them so right now the kind of official place to report is the transient name server and people used to do this actually by hand that uh, you know they observe an object and then they got the, the coordinates the brightness and then they just you know write um write a small report but actually with the current technology you can do it much easier and more automatically so this is a uh, kind of like a, a, a boat i implemented we call it entire boat so what we did is that we take all those uh, selection criteria I showed you before and also including the machine learning ones and then to classify them. And when once we got all those classifications, it will report to this transient and server uh, automatically. So there's no human integration, human intervention needed. So it's very automated. Um, so I've been talking a lot about uh, Antares, but I, I feel, you know, I would be uh, biased if I don't talk about other brokers. So there are several brokers, and there is one of them, but there's also a very um, well-known one, which is uh, um, led by a Chilean group, it's called Alose, and they're also doing very similar thing. So you can see on the left-hand side is their broker visualization. The good thing about their broker is that they also do classification uh, on different ways. So I show you uh, to use that with like a deep learning uh, or a model-based method. Here they are using a random forest just based purely on the uh, features extracted from all the light curves. And from those, they have a different categories, they have agents, young, yeah, state object, and then uh, quasars and variable stars. And they are using random forest to do that. And here on the left-hand side, I'm not sure if you can see clear. So on the left-hand side, there's like a more like a compass thing there in the lower middle part. It's uh, say the LC, the light curve classifier. So that's where they base on this random forest classification and they can tell you which kind of object this is. On the right hand side, it's like um, um, how their, uh, how their uh, machine learning model works when it comes to you know the true label uh, and then compared to the predict label during their training process. Um, some fancy they also offer is that they we uh, they call it a stamp classifier. So imagine that you are looking into an object and you probably don't want to wait until maybe 10, 20 days until you click uh, enough light curves to, to say if you want to follow it up or not. Because some events, they can be pretty short lived, just one to two days. So you probably want to already know if it's worth follow up simply based on one or two images you just got on this object. So they also did some very nice work with uh computational neural network. So what they do, what they did is that they look into the images of this object and they grossly um classify them into like you know Asian supernova, rebel stars, moving object, and bogus. Um and then just simply based on one or two epochs of observations and based on the images, they were able to uh tell you. Um, how likely is to be like a supernova or a variable star? All right, so I talk about a lot about all those like uh, surveys and brokers, and there are also uh, some major parts in um downwards um downstream of the system. So like you know how the uh, sentence can collaborate with each other, and then you know how 
we can inform the observatories and then data archives. These are actually not so much relying on the machine learning, but I think they are worth mentioning because they are all very nice technologies evolving, and then we can, you know, kind of use those technologies to optimize them so that, you know, all this can be like uh, the uh, follow up observation can be triggered uh, automatically uh, without human intervention. Uh, so that's more like, you know, once you get a alert and then you are like, it's going to maybe disappear one or two days. You don't really want to waste time just going through all this human um, decision process. You just want to trigger it right away. And all these are very nice tools to do then. All right, so uh, here's one example that's uh, reported recently by one of the, uh, by the Twiki Transient Facility Group. So this is actually a purely uh, like automatic um, discovery to follow up, to report, to identification, and then to report the uh, classification, and then to report process uh, just done by machines. So there's no human interaction needed. So what it does is that it's tricky. They also have a way, essentially, people to tell from the real and bogus. And then they also employ uh, a computational network, neural network, so that can um, kind of like classify uh, which kind of address it could be, just uh, very similar to the STEM classifier I showed you uh, before uh, from the LSA uh, broker. And then once they did that, they were able to uh, um, kind of like uh, having a prior to this, uh, uh, all these different events. And then they have a dedicated um, uh, follow-up telescope that can take uh, image and spectra so they use this telescope and automatically take spectra, and then they were able to. Then that spectra uh, machine was able to reduce the data on itself. And then once you get spectra, you can compare that to a library of spectra to classify the object, just like we use the like a, to classify different object. And then once they got that, uh, they use the the um. The uh, reporting board just I had for the entire spot and then report that to your transient server. So all this can be done automatically. And that is really nice because you know with all these infrastructures, we no longer need to stay at whole night to do all these observations. We can have a very good night's sleep, and then you know, when you wake up during the morning, you can just look into um uh, this um events and say, okay, so we got this discovery, so then you can save the time and energy to most of the important things which are like, you know, planning um which one is the most important ones and then maybe throwing more results or maybe, you know, getting all this data and write a very nice paper out of it. So these are all the very nice uh, ways we can use uh, machine learning and automation to help us uh, make the uh, life easier for astronomers. So, okay. So these are the kind of things I mentioned before. So from the surface side, from the broker side, you can use machine learning. And then like uh like when you got all these very nice events, you can do automation, like you know, automatic trigger, automatic get data reduce, or the community report. Um, this may be another place that we can use some help. Is that you know, once you got all those, so essentially here, they still need human to write these reports, right? So is there a way we can get rid of that? And the answer is yes. So actually, uh, right now you probably know uh ChatGPT very well, and then we can use this uh large language model, and then to help us to write a report on that. So this is just one example uh from one of the um science platform team. So they used to have like uh um uh uh collaborators to use this platform to like discuss event trigger events, locating um resource. But then they also realized, well, you know, instead of using human being to do all this discussion and then write a summary reports, we probably can use a, like a chatbot or open AI to do that. So here's how they do it. So you can see here they use open AI and then they just fit in like some information from the observation. And then, you know, from those, uh, the spectra they get or the uh, galaxy association, they get a redshift, they get the classification of this kind of object. And they can simply write a, a very nice report, as I showed you before. And all this can be done um, just by machine. So, you know, with us, there's uh, human intervention as possible. 
All right, so that's all I have. And then I hope I convince you that after all this hard works, finally, we as astronomers, we can get a good night's sleep and we can just, you know, uh, rely on the, the machines, automations to do all this hard work for us. And then we can concentrate more on the more important things like, you know, writing a real good science paper or, you know, um, looking into like really nice discoveries. All right, uh, I'll stop here and take questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's a very nice talk and contains many useful information. So um, so now it's a Q and A session. So if you have any questions, you know, please either raise your hand or just post your questions in the chat box. So I can start one. Um, so is it possible for I mean, for the for the broker, can we write our own query, like to interact with the, the broker, or you know, if we want to just do some further uh, constraints, like I will only need the transient within forty megaparsecond or something like that. Can we, you know, apply such a query in a broker or? Um, sure. So I think uh, all these brokers they have uh, different capabilities. So like uh, the one I work on, and then also say like I showed you before, these are the brokers that, you know, we can take like, um, so you can, uh, we call it a filter, but it's actually more like everything you can define by yourselves. And we have like a template that you can use. So we have examples how you can use our query system and then to define these like filters. And then once you got a hit, uh, you know, we can send you like a stack message to notify you, or you can just log in and then to see there's a, like a web page we can browse all these um, different filters and what their results are. Um, and you know, it doesn't need to be like very uh, fancy everything. And it can also be as simple as like, you know, I have a like a private list of objects. Uh, I know they could be very interesting uh trends having their like you know nearby galaxies like m101 m106 or like that which has like more than one supernova explored before i just want to know if there's any um alerts in then and then if there is i want to get notified as soon as possible so this kind of thing we call the watch list so you can also submit this your uh, private list objects we are not going to share that with other people because it's private and then we can notify you right away if there's any alert Know, hitting on those um, targets. So these are all um, kind of like um, service that uh, most of the brokers can provide. Okay. Okay, that's great. So um, for just one more question about the broker. Um, mm -hmm. So you said the broker will also filter out those uh, duplications. Like, I mean, if it's the same target, but it's getting brighter and brighter. So we expect you know, they are still, they, you know, LSST, for example, will still send new alerts. Like, yes. Yeah. So, those, yeah. You no, know, for those, you know, changing objects. But the brokers, you know, are capable of filtering this out. Like, they are old objects and, you know, trying to separate uh, what is the new object and what is, you know, old object. Yeah, so actually, so what the server is like, uh, Rubin does is that it will just send out alerts, you know, it doesn't have any memory. Uh, it might have some memory of the, the same location for like maybe past few days or up to a month. Uh, for brokers, you know, they just gather all this information into one place. So usually what brokers do is that uh, it's um, get all the alerts uh, within a certain um. Uh, range like you know within one arc second or so and then you will get all those alert together and from the like of. so when you are working with broker you can just go and say i want to look into this location or position and see if, you know i can find anything new or you can also say i want to go to this position and i want to see if there's any new if there's any new alert we see in the past few days or if it's you know if if it's only there's a new alert on this position in the in the past few days and there's no prehistory. So that means you probably hit a like exploding star or new object going through that position. So one caution there is that if it's a moving object, it can have like a detection 
uh, all over the place, right? So you don't, also don't want to do that. So you can also say, well, I want to have like a new object, but give me at least, you know, at least like three detections. So I know it's not a moving object, it's a new object. So that's where you can also kind of like writing your own criteria to um to um to separate the moving object from the exploding stars. Um but the broker they can also do they have this different like uh, substring so they can tell you oh this is maybe likely a new uh object like a supernova or this another string uh, as a solar system object. So you can also just go into those streams and find your favorite objects. Okay. Got it. Uh, we have a question from Edward. Hey, Edward. I have a question about, you say there's a, a deep neural net. It can separate the, the transient with uh, only a couple of images. Right. Right. Can you explain that it's a, so, so yeah, I not quite understand how they separate that. For example, the asteroid right, is like a point source. Well, so, so it's a, I think they use an original object. So it's actually pretty um, tricky. But I think what they did is that, so, so I may mislead you a little bit. So I say a few first images, but I think they are not using just one image, so not just one part. So like CTF, I think they absorb the same part of sky. Well, when they are absorbing sky, they take like two exposures in a row. And I think uh, Rubin will do the same thing. And then it doesn't need to be like, you know, back to back. It can be like one exposure in the beginning of night, another one in the close to the end of night. So they can just gather all those to different epochs uh, within the night. And, you know, they can look into those images. So if they see object in one of the image, but not the other epoch, then it's more likely to be a bogus or moving object. And sometimes if we are lucky, it's a very fast moving object. We can even see them like, you know, not a perfect uh, stellar like object. They can have like, you know, um, tail or elongated. So that's another way to discern them from like a uh, explosion uh, star. Mm -hmm. Another way to do that would be, you know, look into the image if there's a nearby galaxy, like the one I show here, you can see a galaxy nearby. So the neural network will think, you know, like, it's a, there's a, there's a galaxy associated with, so it's more likely to be a supernova, but there's no galaxy there, it's just a star, then it's more likely to be a star or a moving object. So this kind of thing, I think that's how it works to, uh, to separate from the uh, transient to an uh, asteroid. Yeah, but I think if, uh, if you put into this background information into the training, it's somehow biased the result, right? The asteroid can obviously pass by the, the, the galaxy and yeah. it has been misidentified as a, a supernovae. Right. So let me see if I have that. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think. Right. They have some chance to do that, right? Yeah. Because so I think when they did the training, they didn't put in any background information. So I just mentioned that just purely because uh, based on my experience. But I think what they did, they just look into the image. So they didn't do anything more than you know, like getting into any like background galaxy information. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um any more questions here? Uh, I have a question about the the uh, the slide twenty seven. Okay. Yeah. So the, so this plot the as a supernova one a right. Right. So you see the that's the the light curve, but it's somehow split in the it's split in the right hand side. Yeah. So um, so it's not uh how to say that. So maybe I didn't explain that to you clearly. So it's uh, on the x-axis is the the so what it does is that it take two pairs of uh, data points. So it can be so it's just random draw any two data points from a light curve. So it can be data points from day one and then another data points from day 10 or day 30. 
And then we just look into the magnitude difference between um, these two epochs. So as you see, the x-axis is the log dt. So that's the difference between the time of these two data points. I see. Y axis is the difference in the brightness. So as you can imagine, you know, the longer you have this time span, the, the more spray into the uh the DM. So that's why you see those spray there. Okay. Other questions? So for those uh, light curve classifier, they so just confirm they will be incorporated into the, the broker? Yes, or... so from Antares, we have made this classification available. And then from um, Alose, they also made this classification available. So if you go to there, uh, like, you know, you can see here, they have this like classifier, so they have this, um, so they have like that kind of probability here. And if you like uh, subscribe to their service, so right now you see this as a, like a web page, so you can get all this information. But if you want to see a large amount of different objects, you can use their, uh, we call them the client. So it's like a Python based code, and then you can subscribe to them, and then you can say you want to run a query of their database. And for those alerts where they classify them as a certain catalog. So you can just use that and specify you want to use either the like the like classifier or the uh, stamp classifier. Okay, so they these classifiers they only rely on um the transient data itself. There's like there's no like host galaxy information um uh, like you know considered when they classify the, the transient, right? Uh, I think for the rapid, we can throw in like the red shifts or the other, uh, the red shift and then the type of galaxy there. Okay. For the uh, Alose, I think what they did is that they have like about 20, 100 ish features, some of them purely based on the light curve, but some of them they associate with different catalog, like they have uh, the wise mid infrared data. Um, so from all those, and I think they also might have some information from like the other catalogs. So from those, um, and then some of them they use, uh, so some of them they can have like a nearby sources from the pen stars. So those are kind of like, it's probably not host galaxy because we, we didn't properly identify them as host galaxy. I can say it's from nearby, um, objects and then they are kind of leveraged into the uh, classification as a, one of the feature there. Right. Okay, good. Okay. Any more questions for Jen Xiu? All right. So, yeah. I mean, if you're yeah. interested, you can go to, so here, like, Alose, the website is alose.online. They can look into the like uh, their uh alerts there. And then for entireis, I think I have it as entireis.noalab.edu. So you can also go there and then try to, you know, play around with all these alerts and then see if there's something interesting to you. And then if you need like to be more specific, like writing your own filters or like algorithms, you can also ask me, I'll be happy to help you to do that. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think uh one of our, our students also working on this kind of platform, you know, like Tom Toolkit and right. broker things. So I think, yeah, we will definitely need your help at some point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, well, in some sense, it's not very right because Ruby won't be online for a few years. So, uh, okay. so we still have time. To we are still, we, we, we kind of not that urgent, but yeah. slowly pushing things forward. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, if there are no more questions for Jin Show, I think that's the end of the the talk today. Thanks, you know, thank you for your um, thanks for your talk again. Yeah, it's really nice uh, to have you here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Right, and thanks for all the participants. So yeah, I think this is a monthly uh, uh series. So I, uh, I think we would still have one next month. Uh, please stay in tune and um yeah and we'll send emails and uh, advertisements uh, when it's close by right okay thanks again for your uh for joining the talk today i'll see you next time